gig at a, at a bar. It was awesome. Oh, well, was welcome. Awesome. Cool. Uh, a little late start. Sandy wanted to share so many high-resolution <laughs> photos with us this evening <laughs> that it totally froze the laptop computer. <laughs> um, and so you'll have to imagine about these high resolution. So Matt uh, will be working on the computer to try to get the file running. And in the meantime, Sandy will share her words of wisdom, if not pictures of wisdom. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sandy McFarland. I know most of you know her from her work in Orleans, her work on Pleasant Bay. And tonight, we welcome her as an author uh, for her book, Rowing Forward, Looking Back. And after her presentation, Sandy will be signing books and talking about her books. So without further ado, Sandy, welcome. I'd like to introduce Sandy McFarlane. Thank you, Judy. I don't know if this thing is on. Yeah, I guess it is. <laughs> well, I'm really sorry about the technological glitch. Um, I'm not a totally illiterate technologically, but I'm not really quite there yet either. And when I had some really ancient slides um, that I wanted to have put on my computer, I went to the photo store and I said, you know, I want to have these slides put on a CD. Yeah, what can you do for me? They said, oh, no problem. What resolution do you want? I said, I don't know. I said, this is a PowerPoint. She said, oh, okay. Well, we get high resolution that apparently is a little too high. So sorry about that. Um, a lot of people have asked me how all of this began. And I might as well start with the way that I wrote the book and how that came about. I worked for the town of Orleans uh, starting in about 1974 under a contract with Orleans. And the contract was because the um, town of Orleans had a bay called Pleasant Bay where cohogs had been in real high supply for many, many years. And it was one big set, and it had been worked for probably since the mid-50s through the mid-70s. By the time the mid-70s rolled around, there weren't very many cohogs left in Pleasant Bay. And the fishermen were trying to figure out what was going on, and they went to the selectmen and asked for some help. And the selectmen in the individual towns run the shell fisheries, but they really listened to fishermen. And when the fishermen said, we want something done, the selectmen usually take that to heart and say, OK. So they had this meeting, and they said, really, what we need is a biologist. And I was sitting in the back of the room. And somebody said, well, we have a biologist here. So why don't we hire her? And I'm thinking, whoa. So the next thing I knew, uh, Gotti Munzee, who became my boss, came looking for me and said, would you like the job? No interview, no nothing, just would you like the job? So I said, sure. Well, that meant that he, he made it very, very clear that when I started working for the town, they were not going to be able to help me much because they had their own responsibilities. And so I was basically on my own. Well, I grew up on the Cape. I grew up not, not for year round, but during summers. I lived in Orleans all my life. And we used to, there was uh, my two sisters and my mother and I shared this little cottage on the shores of Town Cove in Orleans. But we didn't have any car, and so we never went to the beach or anything unless somebody was able to bring us. And so we went to Skakit Beach on the Cape Cod Bay side. Well, in the afternoons, the guy who owned the house that we lived in worked at a little um, boat shop. And he asked us if we wanted to go down in the afternoons and hang around down there, and so we did. And sort of were a pain in the neck to the teenage boys that worked there. There were these three little girls that are, you know, sort of hanging around. Anyway, I learned to row a boat and bail boats, which they were more than happy to let me do, but I had never run an engine in my life. And so I get this job with the town, how many years later, and I'm on my own. I <laughs> think, you know, this is good. So my um, boyfriend at the time loaned me a boat and a six horsepower engine, knowing that I probably couldn't get into too much trouble with this extremely heavy fiberglass boat being pushed by this very weakly powered engine. So I worked at a grocery store in the beginning, and not trying to cut my losses here, I stayed at the grocery store and, and unless this didn't pan out. So I started on this contract in the afternoons. Well, the southwest winds come up in the afternoon. So um, I'm working at the grocery store in the morning and then going out into the bay in the afternoon. And it's about a mile from where I 
um, moored the boat to where I had to be. So I'm bucking the southwest winds all the way, and this, this, it was a really incredible situation. But I also needed to know how to find out whether there were quahogs there. And I knew that I couldn't dive because I was by myself, and that would break the cardinal rule of diving. So uh, a friend made a um, mini bull rake for me. And um, I'd seen bull rakers out in Pleasant Bay on the, the drive to Chatham, but had no idea what bull raking was all about. And I found out real quick why they call them bull rakers. I was not adept at it, but I was able to get the rake into the bottom and find out what was happening with uh, the bottom sediments. And to make it just a little bit more difficult for myself, because I wanted to find out about the sediment, I added hardware cloth, quarter inch hardware cloth to the inside of the bull rake. So now I'm not only just bringing up the shells and the rocks and if there was any quahogs, but I'm also bringing up everything that the basket can hold. So this was, this was an altogether very strange looking um, affair, I'm sure, to everybody who was out there. But most of the fishermen are out there early in the morning and they were gone by the time I was out there, which was kind of lucky for me. So anyway, I, I did this um, rough map of the bottom and sh it showed that there were very, very few places where there were any quahogs. And the sediment was um, either really hard mud, or not, I mean soft mud, or it was so hard with so many shells and shack that it didn't look like you couldn't get another quahog in there if you tried. So anyway, I, I drew this crude map and um, talked to my boss, Guardian. and he said, well, you know, I think that this is good work that you're doing and we ought to have you on as a full-time person. So he went to town meeting and asked the town to make my job permanent. So as of 1975, I became the first shellfish biologist for a municipality in the state of Massachusetts. Well, luckily for me, we didn't have to um, figure out too much more about what was going on in Pleasant Bay because seed uh, quahogs from hatcheries became available. And actually, George Sousa from Falmouth was one of the first people to try it. And he had gotten some funds from an oil spill when the, fla the barge Florida went aground in Buzzards Bay and got some money from that and started to work with seed quahogs that he had gotten from North Carolina. So we got about 10,000 the first year to try ourselves. Well, George had these um, floating sandbox rafts that were huge, and they were very unwieldy for us. So the first year, we decided to just use some bottom boxes, and we didn't want to put all our eggs in one basket. So we put quahogs in 10 different areas around town, and all we did was to really rake the bottom and put the, the seed in there, about 10,000 per area, and I mean 1,000 per area, and then cover it over with some netting and see what happened. We didn't know whether seed from North Carolina was going to survive the plane trip up here, whether it was going to survive once we got it in the bottom, once it, whether it was going to survive the winter. We're talking North Carolina to Massachusetts. You know, all of this was brand new stuff. So it, we did it anyway, and we were relatively successful with that. So we increased the program to, I think it was 250000 the next year. And that's when we started using some the floating sandboxes. And we put them in two ponds. Again, we didn't want to put all our eggs in one basket. And they were in two different bodies of water also. One was in the Nauset system and one in the Pleasant Bay system. And Orleans is blessed because it has these multiple estuaries. It has frontage on Cape Cod Bay, has frontage on the Town Cove and Nauset system and Pleasant Bay. Pleasant Bay being the biggest. So we, we experimented with the quahogs for many, many years. And we did bottom culture, which I hated, and did the raft culture, which was really very, very productive. Um, the, the quahogs grew very, very well. There was no predation because they were up off the bottom. There was a lot of fouling on the rafts, but it, was, it worked really well. But we couldn't fit too many in a, in a raft, and we couldn't fit too many rafts in the body of water because we had a lot of other competing uses for the water. But the bottom culture was a pain in the neck because I could never get the, co the covers to fit tight enough to keep predators out. And I'm sure if we kept working on it, we would have come up with something that worked well, but we only did it for three years. And we learned in the winter of 76, 77, I think, that we had to 
prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And by doing that, what I mean is that that winter we had 14 weeks, consecutive weeks of ice. I mean, everything was frozen. This winter was bad, but that one was 14 consecutive weeks of ice. And it was, it was just incredible. So we lost a lot, of, a lot of gear, a lot of stock, and it taught us a valuable, very valuable lesson. So we kept it going with the Quahog project, but we were also working with other species. And one year we had um, a, an abundance of soft-shell clam seed in one of the estuaries. And so we took a um, pump and literally vacuumed these small clams out and put them in onion bags. And then we had a plow that we were able to bring to some um, intertidal areas and we plowed up the bottom and planted them. And we learned through that one what we had to do as far as planting time. And we learned that if we planted these things on an incoming tide, then the action of the water with the, the loosened sediment made the clams just go down really quickly. And we had very, very little predation that way and very little loss. So that worked really well. But we also knew that we couldn't count on that as a um, system. It was going to be a put and take anytime we had um, a surplus of clams someplace, we could take them out and put them someplace else. But it wasn't going to produce a new set, at least in some of the areas that we tried. But we also tried some really hostile areas to see if that was going to work. And so we tried Cape Cod Bay. And Cape Cod Bay, in our area, has um, a mile or a mile and a half of sand flats when the tide goes out. And it is a really hostile environment. It's uh, rippled sand, um, harsh northwest winds, um, mostly in the winter, but also in the summer. This past winter, for weeks, there was no blue water that you could see any place because the ice was just piled right in the elbow right there, and it was just, you know, total white. Looked like Arctic for, for a long time out there. But we were doing the transplant of the clams, and, and that was working out pretty well. And then we did some mussels. Well, mussels became kind of a funny story because Mussels had not, did not have any regulations whatsoever in the state. And th that winter that was so bad, there was one bit of open water. And that bit of open water um, produced something like 12,000 bushels of mussels in, I don't know, six weeks or so. I mean, it was just incredible. So a bunch of guys were making a little bit of money at this. Well, they were getting about... I don't know, $3 a bushel, if I remember correctly. But they were doing what I call the Orlean stomp to try to clean them. And they were just doing a very minor amount. And what that means is you take a, a bushel basket and fill it half full of mussels, and you put it in the water so that there is some water around the mussels, and you take the heel of your boot and you stomp them so that you're breaking up all of the clumps and all of the, the big things, the rocks and the the periwinkles and all that stuff is going to fall through, and the mussels are relatively clear. Well, one father and son team decided that um, if $3 a bushel was okay, then if they dragged this river, they could put anything they wanted to in these bags and get a buck and a quarter. And as far as they were concerned, a buck and a quarter for as many as they could harvest was fine. And there weren't any regulations. So... They did that, and I'm looking at this saying, God, Orleans has a gold mine here. If all we have to do is manage this, we've got this river that we can keep open if we can, if we can do this, so that if this ever happens again, the guys have some place to go. So I'm thinking that I'm, I'm thinking along the lines of a commercial fisherman to keep their business going. So we had a meeting, and um, I don't remember what year it was, but anyway, had a meeting, and what we suggested was that we had a uh, limit on mussels, um, that they return seed to the bottom, I mean, to the area in which they took them, and um, there was just kind of minor regulations. Well, honest to God, you would have thought that I had just, I don't know what, <laughs> but they wanted to hang me. I mean, it's just no, no two ways about it. I mean, who is this, who was this biologist, and who did she think she was? We, everything is doing fine here. If the state of Massachusetts doesn't care about them, why should you? I mean, it was just unbelievable. So we said, okay, fine. We backed off. If they want to destroy the, the mussel fishery, okay, they can destroy it. So 
about that time, some restaurants started to serve mussels, especially around Provincetown. And they were becoming very popular around with some ethnic groups, a lot of Italian people primarily. And they were becoming quite popular. And so the guys were going out, and the price started rising, 3 5 7 9 11 15 18 dollars a bushel. And the guys are doing a little bit more cleaning. They're getting them, you know, a little bit more marketable. The two gentlemen that had dragged the area went on to something else. And several of, no, two people of the original group that wanted my throat came to me, this is so many years later, and said, Sandy, we got to do something about the muscles. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, we need to have some regulations on this. There's too many people taking them now, and, and they're worth something, and we've we got to have some, some regulations. And I said, well, what would you suggest? So they suggested a size limit and a bushel limit and returning the thing. And I said, just smiled, and I said, well, let's see what we can do. So we had a meeting, put the regulations through. Everything was fine. Kosher, we had a great time. So now we had mussels regulations, and we were the first people in Massachusetts to put regulations on mussels. Well, that continued for quite a long time. Um, and then came scallops. Uh, scallops are what I consider the darling of shellfish. And most people might consider oysters the king, and they probably are, or maybe the queen. But scallops have a, have a um, there's something about them. You know, for one thing, they swim. For another thing, they've got eyes. They live, they're on the surface instead of in the bottom. There's, there's just, there's a charming thing about scallops. So, but they also have a yo-yo syndrome as far as abundance is concerned. They're up one year, down the next, and you don't know what's going on with them. Well, in, uh, let's see, 1980, we had a set of mussels in Pleasant Bay that was just unbelievable. But I'm looking at the, har the scallops being harvested as they're coming in, and they don't have any growth ring on them. And the law says that they're supposed to have a well-defined raised annual growth ring. But these things were huge. They, they, you know, they're literally about that big. So the guy said, well, they're not going to make it. I mean, it just, it's simple that you know, if they've grown this big, they aren't going to make it through the winter. And, and even if they are seed, which we don't believe they are, they aren't going to make it, so we better take them now. Well, we looked at it and looked at it a slightly different way and said, these are seed. I mean, there's, there's no question about these that they're seed. But if you really think that there's a question, then we ought to close the bay and do a study to make sure of, of what we're doing. So we had another one of these meetings. And um, this time it was in January. At least it was after Christmas, but it was in January. And if I thought muscles were bad, this, this was unbelievable. And the selectmen elected to close the bay to scalloping for the, the remainder of the year. And we were supposed to do a study. So we hired Northeastern University to do some histological analysis for us. And it was my job to answer the rest of the questions. So the fishermen had a list of about 10 questions that I was supposed to answer. And off we go on the study. Well, it turned out that, yes, they were seed. Yes, they did make it through the winter. Yes, they did um, survive. And they spawned. And in 1983, we had a bonanza year that was the, literally, the bay was paved with, with scallops. It was just unbelievable. Whether it had to do with what we were doing or whether there were some transplants that were happening, who knows. But at any rate, we, we proved a few things. And one of, the, one of the other things that we were looking at was scallops that had a ring at the hinge as in no other ring. And we looked at those, and they were sort of what I called quirks of the fishery. But those apparently had been born, born late in the season. They also lived through the summer, through the winter. They lived to spawn. But they didn't make it to be harvested. They, they grew tremendously over the summer. They had absolutely enormous gonads, but they just didn't make it after spawning. So that's, that was a question that, that is that's still in dispute um, everywhere in the state of Massachusetts of whether or not to harvest these things. But that was okay. We, we, we made, made it through another crisis. Well, all of this time, I'm recognizing that things are, are happening around me, and I'm sort of sitting in my own little cocoon doing all of the shellfish work and not paying too much attention to what's going on around me, although I'm starting to get some sort of queasy feeling that things aren't quite right. 
And the, the queasy feeling started actually relatively early in the beginning of the building boom that we had, we experienced in Orleans in the late 70s. But it got real queasy in the mid 80s, early 80s actually. And I was motoring my boat down Meeting House River one day and I'm looking at the water and it's red. I mean, it's a, almost the color of my shirt. It's sort of a real funny color red. And I thought, hmm, that's pretty odd. And I took it back, took a sample, and I took it back to the lab, and it was a, um, a monospecific bloom of algae. And we had experienced red tide in our area, um, the paralytic shellfish poisoning organism, and it was a cousin to that particular organism. And I said, well, at least it's not toxic, but it's not a good situation either. And I'd been talking off and on to Don Anderson, who had done some work in our particular area on the, the red tide organism. And so I knew at least a little bit about some of the, the um, phytoplankton and what was happening. But this just, this just struck me as odd. And then one day I got a phone call from this lady on Town Cove, another body of water. And she said, Sandy, have you seen the Town Cove today? I said, no. She said, would you mind coming over to the house? She said, it, it looks funny. I said, okay. So I go over to her house, and there's this patch of tropical green water adjacent to a patch of blood red water. And I'm looking at this saying, ooh, this doesn't look good at all. So I took another sample there, and sure enough, there were two separate blooms adjacent to one another. So I'm starting to catalog these in my brain, but it still isn't quite, uh, it's not really getting through. <laughs> But I'm just sort of cataloging them. And then in, I think it was 1982, oh, first of all, I, I got to backtrack a little bit. We were really active in um, county shellfish advisory groups. Um, there was a shellfish advisory committee. Uh, there was a Massachusetts shellfish advisory committee. And Orleans was always very active in these committees. And we kept hearing from people in, in Falmouth and Bourne and Yarmouth and Dennis, and they were really um, lamenting about how they were having areas that were closed to shell fishing, and it was from pollution. And we thought, oh, God, isn't that awful? And we were, we were sympathetic, and as I say in the book, smug, but sympathetic. We thought, well, you know, thank God, you know, we live in Orleans. You know, nothing's going to happen down there. We're in the good part of the Cape. And then 1982, we got this letter in the mail, and it said that Meeting House Pond would be closed until further notice. Until further notice. And we said, ooh, I guess it hit here too. What is going on? And the state said that in this particular case, it was bacterial contamination, and the most likely culprit was stormwater runoff. I said, stormwater? How can stormwater be causing this? So we went through this song and dance with the state officials telling us exactly what was going on with stormwater runoff and how that was affecting the estuaries. And that unless we got the drainage squared away, that Meeting House Pond would be closed forever, basically. So we looked at that and we said, well, we got to do something about this. This was something that we had caused. We, we were the ones that built the roads. We were the ones that shunted all the water to the estuaries, and so this was, this was our, our fault and our problem to deal with. So we went to the town meeting, and we said we need some money for some engineering, and we said that if we got the money for engineering, that, and we found out what could be done, that we would be coming back to them for some design money, and if we couldn't get some funding from somebody else, the state had promised a transportation bond issue, that was supposed to be for drainage remediation projects, which of course never saw the light of day. But if we did, didn't get that money, then we would be coming back to the town for construction money. So we, we laid it out for them that if they did the first step, that that was, that was the small potatoes compared to what was coming. And they did. And in the, the depth of the, the last recession in the early 90s, the town of Orleans forked out over $400,000 for drainage remediation projects for the town. And ready, shortly after Meeting House Pond was closed, the entire Nauset Estuary was closed for one year, and the second year it was closed for about uh, six or eight months. So we, we knew that we now had some sub substantial problems in the town that we had to deal with. So all of a sudden, well not all of a sudden, but these things that I had been cataloging 
were now starting to really beat me over the head that I couldn't just deal with planting cohogs and fooling around with clams and seeing how that was going to do, that I had to work back on the land and try and work with people who were on the land side of things in order to save the shellfish and to save the estuaries. And so a lot of the work that I did in the, the 80s was in these committees and things trying to get these things squared away. So we did five major drains in that first round, and then we got a grant for another five, and now it's a, it's a common thing in our local comprehensive plan to continue to do drainage remediation anywhere and everywhere in the town so that we don't have any water going into our estuaries that isn't treated somewhere along the line and some, by some method or other. So I thought that was really good, but I had no idea that that was the easy part. And the hard part was going to come very shortly after that, and that was really going to hit me over the head. And that's where the red water was starting to come in, because the red water was beginning to be a sign of the nutrient loading problem that is far and away, as far as I'm concerned, the worst problem that we've got facing the Cape. And it's a, it's a very, very difficult problem to solve. Well, I had seen that the rafts in one of our bodies of water was getting more and more fouled, but as I said, it, it just took me a long time for this to really sink in. I'm, I'm dealing with shellfish, not this, this other stuff, but when it sunk in, it sunk in really, really hard. And so I, I moved. Um, the money, part of the money to pay my salary dried up from the state, and the town decided that my services would be more, um, it would be better for the town if I moved to the conservation department. And so they moved me to the conservation. I became the town's first conservation administrator. Up until that time, it had been, all of the conservation work had been done just by the um, conservation commission who volunteered their time. How they got it done in those building booms is beyond me without any um, staff people to do it. But anyway, they did. So I became the, the conservation administrator. So um, from that point on, I was working on the land. Well, <laughs> as luck would have it, I guess luck, uh, when I moved to the conservation department, the first thing to hit the fan was um, a suit that was brought against the town of Orleans by a person overlooking um, the Atlantic Ocean and also overlooking Nosset Harbor and not what we call Nosset Spit, which is part of a, a barrier beach, saying that the town was not doing its job as far as protecting endangered species were concerned, and that the off-road vehicles that were traveling on this beach were a travesty, and that we needed to do something about this. So we um, had a hearing, several hearings as a matter of fact, to deal with that issue. And I'm, I'm just going to take this time, if you don't mind, to, to read something that I, that I think sort of puts this into a little bit of perspective. Um, when I first started rowing for pleasure, my boat was moored in the town cove, not Lonnie's Pond or the river. I rowed around the cove many times before I ventured out towards Nosset Harbor and the ocean, but one morning I finally felt strong enough to, get, to go the couple of miles from the head of the cove to Fort Hill. It was very early in the day, the tide was high, the ebb had just begun, and I could glide in the shallow channel between the mainland and Hopkins Island as I headed more or less northeast towards Fort Hill. A striped bass broke water chasing small prey and then another fish and another created concentric circles on the calm surface. When I got to Fort Hill, the powerful current helped carry me to the point where the channel breaks in three directions, southwest to the town cove, north to Salt Pond and the Coast Guard Station, and south to Snowshore and the Mill Pond. I turned the boat around to face due east, and although I'd seen this view a hundred times, I looked around now and said out loud, oh wow, the magnificence of this spot catches my breath every time, but by stopping the boat and just drifting, I was able to pause and burn the moment into my brain. The sun was just rising above the barrier beach, a solid line of sand broken only by Nosset Inlet, the vital force of this estuary. But between where I was and the beach, Nosset Marsh was a great green blanket stitched together with blue creeks. Fort Hill, with a small parking area at its summit, offered the only indication of a peopled world. 
The hillside itself was open fields without one house, in utter contrast to the opposite shore where big elaborate houses stood, protected from the sea by great granite boulder walls. It gives you sort of a sense of what the beach meant to me, certainly. But it also is, um, it's just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful place. Um, hold on just a second. Sorry, I thought I had this marked. The hearing was continued several times to accommodate the number of people who wished to comment and to obtain opinions from various experts who needed time to make their reports. Finally, the Conservation Commission issued an order of conditions that included a beach management plan. But to get to the point of acceptance took months of public hearings, study, expert testimony, and acrimonious debate. To some people who testified at the hearings, ORVs were the enemy. This beach, they said, was a real jewel, a natural sand strip that should be left in its natural state. Others who testified said that this beach was a real jewel, a natural place where fish could be caught in the surf and you just had to find the right spot at the right time of day and tide to catch a whopper. To others, the beach was a real jewel, a natural place where sometimes the waves broke just right if you could get to them at just the right time. To others, this beach was a real jewel, a place where you could get a respite from the crowds, where you could distance yourself from your neighbor and your family, could enjoy a day at the beach. To others, this beach was a real jewel, an economic boom to the town and a moneymaker. What they all agreed on was that the beach was a spectacular resource. What they strongly disagreed on was the best way to manage this resource. And to a resource management manager, some of the popular activities were mutually exclusive. This, I think, brings to home what resource management really is all about. It is such an incredible juggling act between all the different points of view that people have about these resources. So I got thrust into the Conservation Commission at just the time that this issue was coming to a head. We got that resolved. We had um, the beach closed for most of the summer as the, the plovers were on the beach. And to say the tempers flared is a gross understatement. And they still do. Every July, it's, it's just um, it's amazing down at the beach. Because people have been driving on this beach for years and years and years, and they had wagons before that, and people have been using this particular beach for a very long time. But as I've told you, everybody has their own opinion of how the beach should be managed. Well, part, you know, there's, there's ironies in everything. And Nauset Spit is disappearing. It is a beach that is a, a relatively small barrier strip. It is totally unstructured. It is allowed to move in the way that it's naturally going to move. It, go, it, takes, uh, it migrates north, which is odd for um, East Coast minlets, but it does migrate north. And it migrates from east to west. And so when you have a big storm, it can take the dunes and literally in 24 to 48 hours, it can flatten them when you have a really bad storm. And so th all of that sand goes to the inside and the whole beach takes a hike to the, to the west. Well, when you have a flattened beach, what we used to do was to plant beach grass to try and build up the dunes again. But in the, the irony of ironies, when the dunes disappeared, it became plover habitat. And if it was plover habitat, then we couldn't plant beach grass because we were taking plover habitat away. So there have been other beaches in Massachusetts that somehow have been able to build up their beaches, but we've not been able to. So there is a, a, a group of homes that is um, getting closer and closer to the Atlantic Ocean, and they've been there. It, it used to be a very exclusive part of town, very high real estate values, and that's getting really close. Well, in 1987, Pleasant Bay 
had been, that beach is also a, an unconstructed barrier beach. It had been moving further and further south. The channel had been getting narrower and narrower. And as I write in my book, it was waiting to exhale. And when it did, it was in January of 1987. It was not a really nasty Northeaster by Northeaster standards, but the, the, um, Everything was right celestially to have a really high tide with this particular storm. At any rate, it carved a V notch in the beach, and because the beach was waiting to go, it just, on the out succeeding outgoing tides, it created a new inlet. And within days, it was deep enough to have fishing boats going through the new inlet. It's about a 150-year cycle, according to Graham Geis. Um, we don't, we was what, witnessing day one. What happened in the upper part of the estuary was that we got a reprieve from our water quality problems for a little while. Um, the water quality just improved dramatically within a year's time. But also within a year's time, we had a rise and fall of tide of a foot. Now, people around here will say that sea level rise is probably going to be a foot in a century, maybe a little more than that now, or a little higher than that now, some of the estimates are. We had the same thing in one year. So it was just a whole different body of water that we were looking at. We we're listening to the news like everybody else, watching houses in Chatham drop, go into the drink, and we're saying, you know, we, we don't really want that to happen, but the regulations are really strict about what you can do on coastal banks. So issue number two crops up with the Conservation Commission. And we're, we're just watching this. Well, then we get the perfect storm of 1990, and we get walloped with a 100-year storm. I don't think it was that bad here, but for us, it was really bad. And there's erosion, just, just incredible erosion. So the state had some um, uh, emergency regulations where they let people put sand on, the, on their banks to try and reconfigure them. So they put the sand on, but that meant heavy equipment and you know, all kinds of stuff on the beach. And here's the Conservation Commission trying to deal with this. And the people weren't happy about just putting plant plantings and sand on their banks, but there was nothing more they could do. Then December, the, the grass didn't even have a chance to take hold. We got walloped with another one. It was merely a 75-year storm, but it, it just made everybody so nervous that they came to us in droves and said, you know, we want rock. That's, that's all we want. We want rock walls. And finally, the, the commission relented because they saw what had happened in Chatham and they were trying their best to keep the environment as pure as it could be for as long as it could be and protect the property as well. So it was a real juggling act for the commission. It was very, very difficult when you're trying to tell your neighbor that they can't protect their house. I mean, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing if any of you are, are commissioners, you understand this. So it was a, a real tough time for the commission. Anyway, we got through that issue, and then we just have the building, and the building just keeps coming and coming and coming, just as it is everywhere on the Cape. We're, we're doing all of you know, everybody is trying the best they can with what they've got to work with. But there are new tools on the horizon that are allowing us to work and plan for the future. And finally, we're seeing some fruits of our labor. Um, one of them is a geographic information system that allows a lot of information to be put on graphically so that people can actually understand what is happening. And we were able to use that system. Um, pretty effectively. Um, also, we had our groundwater mapped, and the, most of the Cape has their groundwater going in ma uh, major directions. Around here, it's either going to go to um, Buzzards Bay or Nantucket Sound. Um, other parts of the Cape, it's going to go to Cape Cod Bay, Nantucket Sound, or the Atlantic Ocean, until you get to Orleans, and then things get really funny. And because we're in the elbow, it, it just didn't quite work as neatly as it did in other areas. And there were all these estuaries and peninsulas all over the place. And each peninsula is a groundwater divide where the groundwater is going to go one way or the other on this peninsula. So we went to the town again and we said we need some money to map our groundwater. And um, they said, okay, and we got that mapped. And we found out that we had 10 separate watersheds within the town of Orleans. And actually, if you cut it down, you can make more than the 10. Each pond has its own, too. But there were 10 major watersheds. Well, that makes it a little easier to start to deal with things like wastewater management when you're trying to deal with, when you're trying to, to draw up a plan of, of how to deal with our own personal waste within the town. And 
Orleans and Chatham have both embarked on wastewater management planning efforts. Um, they're both at the at the, the bottom of the of the curve trying to do that, but they're they're working along those lines. But one of the things that has been um, really uh, remarkable to me is that when Meeting House Pond was closed, um, the people were so upset about it that they wanted to do anything that they could to try and, and help the situation. And they started a pond group. And the Friends of Pleasant Bay was the first one, and that took in um, people all over Pleasant Bay. But then the pond, the individual pond group started. And you know, you, when it's in your own backyard, you tend to pay attention. And people volunteered for all kinds of things, including water quality. And we started a water quality program with these volunteers. And these people have just been remarkable. And a lot of the, the, the um, samples get taken to certified laboratories. And they usually write on the money one to one almost every time they, they take them. It's just been a, an incredibly gratifying thing to watch these the the citizen monitoring program. And I know that there are citizen monitors all over the Cape, and it's just, it's just a tremendous, tremendous uh, program, positive program. But another thing that, that's hitting us now is, or not hitting us, that it, that's, that's coming, is a concept called shellfish gardening. And that's a concept that has been used in um, Long Island uh, very successfully. Virginia was, I think, one of the first states to start it. Maryland is getting going on one. North and South Carolina are thinking about it. And one of the Gulf states is also doing it. And what that basically means is, in, in, I'll give you an example of the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay has a group called um, Tidewater Oyster something or other. I can't remember the full name of it. But these people have gone through classes to become master oyster gardeners. And if any of you are familiar with the master gardener program from the um, extension service, it's a, it's a pretty heavy duty classroom experience that you need to be able to pass to call yourself a master gardener. These people are master oyster gardeners. They go through um, uh, husbandry, diseases, um, everything to do with the oysters. But they're not growing them for their own consumption or for the towns. They are growing them strictly for water quality um, mitigation. And that, to me, is just a remarkable achievement. And they've got, I think they've got 2,000 people involved, or maybe more. In, in Long Island, they have a different system where part of it is gone is to the town, where the town can use it for remediation, and the individuals growing it gets half of the stock for their own consumption. They also, in Long Island, have a place that they've set aside where they put, where they allow people who don't necessarily live on the water to have their own little plot. So it's like a community garden. Um, this, is, this is something that, that I can really sink my teeth into and for the first time in years feel something positive coming out of this. And I just find it very, very ironic that um, it's, it's going full circle for shellfish. And the, the way that I have, have mentioned this is to say that um, the Cornell Extension staff told of other shellfish gardening programs in other parts of the country. I followed up on several of them. There were programs in Virginia, Maryland, North and South Carolina, and Louisiana was the last one. In Virginia, the Sea Grant researchers started the program that is now recognized independent association called Tidewater Oyster Growing Association. They have over 2,000 participants, and Master Gardener is what I've mentioned. In many of these programs, the object is not to grow shellfish for personal consumption, but to grow shellfish strictly to assist in water quality improvement. My mind was spinning. I could envision a program started at the grassroots level where the people who are ready, willing, and able could lend a hand. There are two community-sponsored hatcheries on the Cape developed through partnerships. One is located next door in East Ham. The other is in um, Barnstable County. Um, these two hatcheries could become important for citizen shellfish programs endorsed by the towns. And I, don't, I haven't asked anybody, I'm just saying this on my own, my own mind, but I, I still think that they, it could be the least discussed. Um, why not begin citizen shellfish gardens, especially in highly eutrophic ponds where there is already organizations comprised of people who are anxious to help? 
Sure, there are problems to overcome, and the idea needs lots of discussion, but a potentially beneficial problem like this needs to focus on the positive, not the naysaying that can get ideas really back down. I, I just think that this is something that is, that is really, um, really something that we can really grab hold of. I said, what a great way to get more shellfish in the water. The goal of the shellfish department when they hired me back in 1974. What a great way to get back to the ideas generated by Dr. Belding at the turn of the 20th century when Massachusetts was among the highest producing states for shellfish. What a great way to come full circle. And the reason that I'm saying that is because there, I have a ch uh, chapter here that I call The People Speak. But the way that I open up this chapter is, Wide expanses of beautiful white sand beaches. Large salt marshes that change color with every season. Acres of trails to walk in many different types of environments. Sand flats to explore that extend over a mile from the shore. Shellfish that can be harvested by the family on an outing to the shore and later eaten with cocktails or cooked to have a mess of steamers. Quiet rivers and ponds begging for that kayak or canoe trip. Beautiful vistas at the end of roads that all seem to lead to the sea. Sunrises over the water, sunsets over the water, moonrises over the water, fishing opportunities by foot, by ORV, by boat, and in fresh water and in salt water, recreational opportunities in every town. This is the Cape Cod of the early 21st century. The fastest growing county in Massachusetts, the highest growth of retirement age people in New England, thousands of acres Cape wide closed to shell fishing from bacterial contamination. Land is good investment because of rising values, relatively low tax rates, dwindling numbers of people who make a living from the sea, walled-in shorelines to keep out the sea, loss of beaches from walled-in shorelines, signs of eutrophication in all estuaries, drinking water threatened and wells abandoned because of contamination, congested harbors and waiting lists for moorings, beach parking lots full by 10 a.m. on summer sunny days, huge gaps between the haves and have-nots, Mythical affordable housing for the labor force. Total reliance on personal automobiles because limit, very limited mass transportation. Traffic gridlock, strip malls, summer labor force imported increasingly from overseas. A peninsula bursting at the seams. This is also the Cape Cod of the 21st century. I couldn't end on that kind of a note without that positive part of the shellfish gardening. And I hope that this takes, takes root and I hope that we, we can all enjoy the Cape for the rest of the 21st century. Um, I guess I'll stop there and answer any questions, uh, but I do need to say that, that, that I'm in totally indebted to the Friends of Pleasant Bay who asked me to give a presentation when I retired in 1998, and they're the ones that asked me to write this book. I never would have done it without some encouragement from somebody, and certainly having Jeff McLaughlin as my personal letter was just absolutely phenomenal. So. With that, um, and sorry about the no pictures, but anyway, thank you very much. Sure. Absolutely. Um, and in, in the book, I describe um, how bad I think things are on the land um, and, and w the difficulty that we're going to en encounter in trying to counter that, especially where the groundwater flows in our area of about a foot a day. That's, that's going to take a very, very long time to clean up what's already in the ground, let alone what's coming from new development. So absolutely. But I think that that if, if there is a way to at least start on the estuary side of things, and uh, as we're doing this, do it a two-pronged two, so two approach. But I'm, I'm real interested in the water part, so. Ernie. Two by twos? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. The Pleasant Bay Alliance is um, often said to be kind of a regional model of intercounty cooperation between different municipalities. And, um, I'm wondering if you could offer some insight as to why that might be the case where in Massachusetts we often have individual towns not working together. Um, why, why is that? 
it was the first time in, as far as I know, recorded history that those particular towns actually did something together, in, especially in this massive a scale. Um, and the, the, the reason that it even came into being was because of the boating laws that went into effect in the early 90s. And the boating laws said that you could not have a, any new structures for which a um, permit was required from the state until and unless the town had a state approved resource management plan if it was an area of critical environmental concern, which Pleasant Bay was. So, if any, and we, had, we were having like, you know, 20 applications for docks, private docks um, a year coming into our office. And there was a moratorium on docks when those laws went into effect until you got that done. So the, the impetus for it was um, supposedly to get the dock issue squared away. But what really happened was, was kind of interesting. Um, it took about, there was a couple of false starts, but once we were actually got going, it took about two years to actually write the plan. And I think it was done in a, in a relatively um, well thought out manner. There, were, there was a, one individual that was appointed by the selectmen from each town to be on a steering committee. And then a technical advisory committee made up of people like myself, the harbor master, um, anybody in the planning department, um, highway, I, th I think highway may have, no, maybe not highway, um, anybody who was, who was part and parcel of that was on this technical advisory committee. Plus, people from the outside, people from the state and the National Seashore were also part of this, the steering committee. And we, we hammered out some of the issues, and it came down to five major issues for the plan. And I, I'm, I, every time I do this, I forget one, but I'll try again. There was um, biodiversity, um, boating and, and harbors, um, shellfish and aquaculture, structures, every time. <laughs> no matter which way, what order I do it, I always forget the fifth one. It, it doesn't matter. There were five major issues. And those issues were debated in the winter time. And um, it was just incredible that hundreds of people came. And when all was said and done, the, the dock structure was the least, probably the least important of any of them because the people in that part of the Cape are just so overwhelmingly concerned and um, uh, just know a lot about it and, and, and want to do what they can to help. Hundreds of people showed up at these meetings. It was just, it was unbelievable. So the plan was passed almost unanimously in three out of the four towns. And the fourth town was Brewster that has the major watershed, but only about 40 feet of water on the bay. So it was passed unanimously. And then they went into impl implementation. And from that, from the plan, they still have a steering committee. It, there are different members on it. They still have the technical advisory committee. Um, and they, they go through different parts that the plan brought up that need to be addressed further. And they just keep going along, getting studies done, and trying to figure out better ways of handling the bay. And it's, um, it's just very cooperative. And I, I don't know why more than the people who are involved are very supportive of the program and really want to do a good job. Yes. Well, some some bodies of water they grow faster than others. Also, that there's a huge range of growth of scallops, and sometimes you can tell where scallops come from just by the way they look, as people say they can anyway. Um, it kind of depends more on when they're born than than the, um, I mean, it's obviously the, f the quality of food that's in the water, the phytoplankton in the water, but also when they're born has a great deal to do with it because they only have that one growing season to put on all of their growth. But you mentioned these were seed. These were seed. Have no clue why that particular year they were enormous. No clue. They were, I'm sure that they were born really early, but other than that, have no idea. Nope, not at all. I don't think anybody's looked at it hard enough to be able to answer that question. So when you're talking about shellfish and um, diets and natural conditions, anything can affect them. It could be uh, too much rain, too little rain, 
um, <laughs> you know, whatever is, is contributing to the, the natural flora that's in the water in that particular year happened to be perfect conditions for them to grow like crazy. So, I, but I don't know what it was. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Plan C.